So can everyone else just make sure that their microphones are muted? Yeah, awesome. Great, I'll mute myself um, in a second as well. Okay, should I just start? Or? So, uh, yes, go for it. We are now live. <laughs> <laughs> floor is yours. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to be able to share some results, some recent results from a uh, RAMS simulation. Um, so in, here I'm particularly interested in uh, understanding the vector modes of the gravitational field. So what we typically call the gravitomagnetic potential or vector potential. And by extension, I'm also interested in uh, looking at the vector modes in the matter sector. Um, so here, uh, I'll be focused only on the vorticity field. So this uh, gravitomagnetic potential is uh, very interesting to look at because it's an intrinsically GR quantity, so it's not in Newtonian gravity. And it also appears um, starting from second order in uh, cosmological perturbation theory in lambda CDM. So from the point of view of vorticity, this is not a, a general quantity at all. So you can think of this as being Newtonian up to some uh, corrections. However, um, numerical simulations play a huge role for understanding, understanding it because if you look at a perfect fluid um, in an CDM, then uh, vorticity will vanish at any order in perturbation theory. <coughs> However, we know vorticity is there, and this is because um, it's excited by basically shell crossing of dark matter, which also excites uh, velocity, velocity dispersion. So this, these are the two vector modes I'm interested, interested in. Um, so you can think of this as being subdominant so um, with respect to the scalar counterparts. And this is uh, mostly true. However, you need to check this in different scenarios and on different scales. So for instance, we know that if we look at very uh, nonlinear scales, then vorticity can be comparable to the velocity divergence, which is the scalar part of the velocity field. Also, if you approach uh, superizing scales, then if you take the ratio between the vector potential and the scalar potential, this can actually reach the percent level. And overall, it's important then to understand these vector modes uh, because if you, they, they could contaminate your observations, uh, basically. So first, I will try to fix some notation, notations and conventions here. So in Gram says we use the uh, three plus one metric, which I have here. So in this metric, we keep uh, scalar and vector degrees of freedom and we drop tensor modes here. So the vector potential I'm looking for is um, contained in this shift vector beta. Now, if you look at the geodesic equations, so this is the most uh, general expression in the three plus one formalism. So here, the red term, um, I'm highlighting the, the force term or the acceleration terms that comes from uh, the shift vector and that contains what we call the uh, gravitomagnetic force. Also, so since we need to isolate uh, vector modes, so I use the typical um, scalar vector decomposition. So if I have a three vector, I can write this into as a rotational part and a non-rotational part like this. So for the fields of interest here, um, so velocity and the shift vector. So for the velocity field, I'm looking at the vorticity, which is the rotational part of the velocity field. And in the case of a shift vector, you can also decompose this into a scalar and a vector component. And I'm always interested in the vector piece of this shift vector, which is what we call uh, vector potential or gravitomagnetic potential. So for this, um, so the results I'm going to show are based in uh, on a high resolution ground size and body simulation. So this uh, simulation has a box size of, of uh, 256 megaparsecs over H with 1024 cubic dark matter particles. So the special resolution of the simulation is set by the adaptive mesh refinement scheme. 
So this means that you will start um, solving your equations and projecting your quantities on a grid which, which has, uh, in principle, the same, uh, same number of cells as the particle number. But as the simulation goes on and you develop high density regions, then the code will create refined regions. So basically, so you're going to have a good resolution in uh, er areas where the actual circuit formation is happening. So in this particular uh, setup, the most refined regions, the resolution can be increased by a factor of 128. So this simulation starts from uh, region 49. So we set initial conditions with uh, perturbation theory. And in order to measure the velocity field from the particle data from a given snapshot of the simulation, so we use uh, the DTFE code, which is the standard code used for this uh, purpose. So here I'm showing you some like a visual impression. So this is just a slice of the simulation box along a given direction at redshift zero. So from left to right, I'm showing a density field, the amplitude of the vorticity field, and the, and the amplitude of the vector potential. So you will see there is a um, clear correlation between the structures in the density field and the vorticity field. And this is not uh, very clear um, for the case of the vector potential. So you will see that if you look at some peaks in this map, which are around 10 to the minus 7, so it's the um, typical amplitude or the, the maximum amplitude of this vector potential, you can kind of find a corresponding density peak, but the opposite is not uh, always true. So I will start showing some results for the vorticity uh, power spectrum, which I'm showing here on the right. So this is the redshift zero uh, vorticity power spectrum measured from the simulation. So this is on the black dots. So as I said, um, standard perturbation theory doesn't give you a prediction for this uh, because it vanishes for a perfect fluid. But if you look at some other approaches such as EFT of LSS, so they actually they predict the the slope basically on the, or, or the shape of the spectrum on the large scales it should follow a power law like this. So we can try to actually fit in this uh, plot the straight line. So what we do is to take this range region and try to find a, a best fit. Um, so we we can find a value for this parameter of the, this index n omega, and this is the value we found here, which is uh, roughly compatible with previous results in the literature. So you can also um, try to do the same towards nonlinear scales so on this green region on the right. So you can also put, try to fit a straight line here uh, to the data. There is a clear oscillation here that obviously is not captured by this, but you can still uh, do it. Um, so this is what we have here in, in red. Uh, this is the value we found for this uh, the slope in this regime up towards non very nonlinear scales here. And this is a very close uh, actually to some value uh, suggested in the literature by Han et al. 2000, 2015. So now we can also, besides trying to uh, parameterize the shape of the power spectrum, the vorticity power spectrum, we can try to parameterize the uh, evolution of the amplitude of this spectrum. So for this, we can use this equation here, which is given in Pueblas and Scochimaro 2009. So basically here you use the linear growth uh, factor to a power of gamma, and you try to basically match the amplitude or evolve the amplitude from redshift zero to any other, to predict the amplitude at any other redshift or the other way around. So here on the right, I'm again showing vorticity power spectrum. Um, now I have different colors. These are all different redshifts below uh, 1.5. So here you can basically, so this spectrum, they're aligned like this because I have scaled them using this parameterization with this value of uh, gamma, uh, gamma omega. So I have 
basically you can uh, put yourself in, uh, look at the given scale at the given k mode here and see how this k mode the amplitude here evolves with redshift and then you can again find the best fit and find this um, index gamma and this is the value we found on large scales here on this green region so there's obviously obviously there's some scale dependence depends on the k mode you're looking at but this is a region we take and this is the value we found and this value is somewhat higher than other values reported in the literature that uh, as i show here so they are mostly close to seven or a little bit above seven this is what we found so we can try to play the same game uh, and try to predict the evolution of the amplitude of the vorticity power spectrum on nonlinear scales so now i'm looking at this green region here on the right so again, these are different, uh, the same uh, vortex power spectrum, but now these are scaled with a different index, which is this one. And to get this value again, you look at the given scale um, here in this green range, you follow the evolution um, at a fixed scale, and then you try to do a, you do a best fit, and you get this gamma um, nonlinear value. So this is the value we have here. So this actually, this parameterization was previously used for large scales. Now we try to apply this to nonlinear scales, and this seems to work with good uh, approximation. However, we do note that so in the previous feed for large, large scales, uh, so I could take all all the red chips, including 1.5. But if you look at this orange line, we see it, which is actually 1.5, red chip 1.5 you see this won't uh, follow this trend. So all red chips below this one, they would match this evolution with this index. But something happened uh, towards higher red chips that do not allow you to, to do this. And so we didn't actually take into account this uh, data point for the, for the fit to find, the, to find this value of uh, gamma. So in some sense, the, this parameterization on nonlinear scales breaks down, but uh, breaks down at um, above redshift one, but below that redshift, you can. This seems to work up to very nonlinear scales uh, quite well. So that's enough for uh, vorticity. Uh, so I will now move on to the vector potential. Um, so first, first I want to show you the um, power spectrum or the dimensionless power spectrum of this vector potential and measure from the simulation. So this is on the left. So you can see this uh, data points here. So these are four different red chips. And also I'm showing you in the solid line, uh, the second order perturbation theory prediction for this uh, quantity. So you will see that apart from the last, very last data point, they, they seem to match um, quite well. And obviously, then you see some departures when you approach uh, linear scales. And these uh, departures, they seem to be they seem to be very um, in very good agreement with previous results uh, in the literature. You can also, as I said, it's important to quantify the relative uh, magnitude of this vector potential relative to the scalar potential. So this is why on the right, I'm showing you the relation between the spectrum of the vector potential and on the scalar potential. So at the same for red chips. So if you look at red chips zero, which is um, the black dots, you will see actually this is a few times 10 to the minus five, this ratio. So that means that, that the square root of this is roughly, it's almost uh, 1% and it, still, it stays almost at the 1% level towards um, up to very nonlinear scales. So this is also consistent with previous uh, studies. So besides looking at the um, at this uh, vector potential, in the whole box, you can also try to zoom in and look at this quantity in dark matter halos of the simulation. So this is what we did here. So for this, we constructed a halo catalog um, using the halo finder Rockstar. So you can add it, it, each uh, red chip look for all the halos in your simulation, and then you can uh, split this halo samples into different uh, mass ranges. So what we did here was to consider there three different uh, mass ranges. So we have the higher mass range, where we have the most mass, massive halos of the simulation. 
so with masses above 10 to the 14.5 um, solar masses. And then we have an intermediate mass range and a lower mass range uh, with uh, halos with masses around basically one order of magnitude uh, smaller from the, from the previous range. And then I get to look at this the potential uh, in these halos in different uh, mass ranges. So here on the right, I'm showing you just some visualization again for this. Um, so on the left, I have the density field. Uh, so basically, this is a, like a picture of, of the halo, if you will. Um, and on the right, I have on, on the middle um, column, I have the amplitude of the vector potential. So you will see that there is not a clear correlation and or the distribution is not clearly correlated with the density distribution um, on the left. And for comparison, I'm showing you the scalar uh, potential map on the right. So in this case, this uh, similarity between the structures in this map and the density, they are very clear as opposed to the vector potential. This is something that we also expect uh, to be. So on the bottom, I'm just showing you a, a different halo with a lower uh, mass. So we can try to draw some information um, from this uh, by taking some spherical averages of the field. So you basically, um, so you, you can get the spherical average of any given field around the halo centers. And this allows you to then plot a radial profile of the field, starting from the uh, halo center towards the outskirts. So before doing this, however, we so since we want to compare different types of halos um, of different masses, we need to take into account that halos can live in very different environments. So in general, the potentials themselves, they are not observable quantities. So in general, the potential, we can split this uh, in a crude way into a, a contribution coming from the halo itself and also contribution coming from the environment. So to, to isolate the contribution coming from the halo itself, um, what we do is we subtract. So we take the spherical average and then subtract the values of the uh, vector potential and the scalar potential at uh, twice the halo radius, so from this, uh, beyond the, the halo. So this is a crude way to isolate the contribution given uh, by the uh, corresponding to the halo itself. So then, as I said, you can plot some radial profiles. Uh, this is what I shown here on the right. So we can look at the uh, left column, which is the relative zero result. So here, each color in, encodes a different um, halo mass range, as I as I shown uh, before. Uh, so on the top, we have the density profile of the halo, which is not very um, relevant for us. So the important thing is that on the left, we have the inner parts of the halo. And on the right, we stop at uh, the halo radius. So what's, what's important for us is to look at the uh, magnitude of the vector potential. So this is the middle uh, row here. So this is the spherical average of the magnitude of the vector potential. And you see that this will uh, this actually correlates uh, with the halo mass. And it flattens towards the, uh, the inner parts of the halos. So again, we can compare this to the scalar gravity potential. So this is what we do on the bottom uh, row. So here I am showing you the ratio between the vector potential magnitude and the, and the magnitude of the scalar potential. So the, then there's something interesting here because this ratio doesn't seem to depend on the actual halo mass. And actually this stays flat inside uh, the halos. So besides looking at the potentials uh, themselves, we can also look at the acceleration terms of the for or the force terms that they contribute in the geodesic equations. So in particular, this is the, the expression of the magnitude of the gravitomagnetic force or gravitomagnetic acceler uh, acceleration. Um, again, we can take this and get the spherical averages. In this case, there is no need to subtract anything because it's already a force term acceleration term and this is what we plot here on the right so again let's focus on relative zero here so each color again is the the same uh, mass different mass regions as before 
And on the top, I'm showing you the magnitude of the gravitomagnetic force. So this is the profiles. There is also correlation with the mass. And so on the top, um, um, mass range. So at the one sigma level, this magnitude of this acceleration is also compatible with um, some previous result uh, found with uh, G evolution. So this is at the one sigma level. However, if you look at the actual most massive helium simulation, it lies beyond this one sigma region. It's actually uh, roughly one order of magnitude uh, larger. Then on the middle uh, row, I'm showing you just the gradient of the scalar gravitational potential. This is not uh, very important or relevant for us. What is more relevant for us is the ratio between these two types of acceleration. So this is why I'm showing here on the bottom. And again, we see that this um, this is also weakly dependent on the halo mass. However, now there is some, this, it doesn't stay flat as the potentials, the potential ratio. Now this kind of decreases by roughly one order of magnitude or so towards the outskirts of the halo. So this is why I wanted to show you, I uh, want to share. Um, so in summary, numerical simulations play a huge role for understanding the vector modes of the gravitational field and of the matter sector as well. So we can um, provide some power law fits to the data, uh, to the vorticity power spectrum, so we can characterize the shape and the time evolution of this on linear and nonlinear scales. Um, we can also look at the halo mass or the halo um, distributions. So we have found that inside the halos, the ratio between these two, the vector potential and the scalar potential, remains roughly flat and around 10 to minus 3, regardless of the halo mass. And something similar happens uh, when we take the ratio between the gravitomagnetic force and the standard uh, force term. Uh, so the ratio also remains at around 10 to minus 3. Uh, regardless of the halo mass and decays by roughly one order of magnitude uh, towards the outer parts of the halos. So that's that's for me. Cool. Thanks, Christian. Um, before we start the questions, I'll just let everyone on YouTube know that we're going to go to a break. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay, awesome. And welcome back, everyone on YouTube. <laughs> um, so go ahead, take it away, Mihaly. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Michele Grasso, and I just started last year of my PhD student, uh, my PhD at the, the Center for Theoretical Physics in Warsaw, under the supervision of Miko Ekorzinski and Eleonora Villa. Um, First of all, I wish to thank the organizer to let me talk about uh, uh, my PhD work, uh, which is uh, about this new tool I've developed for light propagation numerical relativity called Beagle Light. Um, okay, so let's start saying that uh, to make prediction and modeling on cosmological observables that are, let's say, as much accurate as we can, we should uh, take into account all possible physical effects acting on the light during its travel uh, toward us. Uh, of course, this is a very difficult task. So uh, what we usually do is to make some uh, uh, reasonable assumption in order to, to simplify a bit our uh, description of the model. Uh, so one of the um, first uh, main used assumption is the geometric optics approximation, meaning the fact that uh, the, the photon's wavelength is much smaller than the distance, uh, the, the, all the characteristic distances of, of the problem, and for instance, the distance between the observer and the meter. So uh, for our description, we want to be as much general as we can, so we will allow the observer and the meter to move freely along the world lines. Uh, with the only assumption that the, 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 the distance, uh, the, the, the typical scale in which the, the, of the region in which the motion takes place is much smaller than the distance between the meter and the observer. 
So within this assumption, we can consider that the photons uh, travels along null geodesics and that uh, this null geodesic connecting the, the emitter and the observer can be uh, specified giving the observer position and tangent vector. Of course, these two quantities are related to the position and the tangent vector at the emitter via the null geodesic itself. Okay, so now, since the observer and the emitter are free to move, uh, after some time there will be different positions and they will be connected by different geodesics. Again, this null geodesic can be specified giving the new position and the new tangent vector of the observer. So it is easy to understand that we can parameterize the whole family of null geodesic connecting the observer and the emitter at any time giving the, um, the variation in position delta x and the variation in the position in the tangent vector delta l. These two variations are also the key quantities that we have to use in order to describe how the null geodesics differ uh, uh, from the, um, from the uh, fiducial one gamma naught. So uh, the, the variations are governed by the um, the geodesic deviation equation, which essentially defined a map, a linear map between variations around any two points of the space time connected by null geodesics. This double map here uh, encodes all possible effects coming from the interaction between the light and, and the curvature of the space time. And essentially the geodesic deviation equation can be written in terms of this double map in this way. So the W map is composed by four four dimensional operators that we call by local geodesic operators or BGO in short. And from a direct comparison with the uh, Sachs deformation matrix, we can see that the BGOs have some more rich structure in the sense that they will encode additional effects. So just to, to give you an intuition on what is the, the link between the, the BGO formalism and the Sachs formalism, uh, it is possible to, to show that the Jacobi matrix is the two times two subpart of this W Excel operator. Okay, so one of the main novelty of the BGO uh, approach is that they provide a straightforward way to describe what happened when uh, the observations occur for a prolonged period of time. And so, in addition to the standard lensing effects, they can also describe the drift effects, meaning the secular changes of observables. So in this sense, the BGO formalism provides a unified framework that can be used to extract all possible uh, observa optical observables. So my uh, PhD work is all about the application of the BGO formalism uh, um, in, in uh, numerical relativity. And what I did was to uh, recast the BGO uh, framework in three plus one form in order to obtain a recipe for, for uh, calculating observables in numerical relativity. So this is a recipe and as all recipes, we need some ingredients. So the first ingredients uh, of the recipe is the space-time metric that can be inserted inside the geodesic equation to obtain the geodesic connecting the emitter and the observer. So it is uh, well known how to uh, calculate geodesics in, uh, in numerical relativity, and I mainly follow the, uh, the formalism given by Vincent and Novak in 2012 for uh, the geodesic uh, equation in 3 plus 1. So now the second ingredient of the recipe is a parent transported frame. And we need this because we want to compare quantities which are defined to different points of the space time. So to obtain the parent transported frame, we have to apply the parent transported equation. Uh, and this is the form of the parent transported equation in three plus one that I have obtained to the vectors of the frame. Another ingredient is the space time uh, curvature. Uh, or to, be, to say better, the, the curvature along the line of sight. And this is the expression of the curvature along the line of sight in terms of its three plus one quantities. So we can mix together these two, we can insert these two other ingredients uh, inside the geodesic deviation equation for the BGO in order to obtain the BGOs along the line of sight. 
Once we have that, we can mix the videos with the observance of small, uh, for velocity and acceleration to calculate cosmological observables. So all these steps are encoded inside the Beagle Light package, which is a mathematical package I have developed for a containing function to, uh, to set up and solve the equation we just saw. In addition, I also included the other useful function like the one to perform the three plus one splitting of a given covariant metric or perform the covariant and derivatives of tensors. So the main reason why I use the uh, mathematics is that uh, we can take advantage of the many well-tested uh, numerical methods already implemented uh, there for uh, solving ODEs. And also we can use the uh, precision control, the arbitrary precision control options, which essentially allow us to set up the precision of our numerical calculation. So in the rest of my talk, I will show you how um, some tests and application on, of the Beagle Light package. And in particular, so the first test regards the calculation of the angular emitter distance and the right shift in the Lambda CM model. So the quantity that I, um, we want to evaluate for this test is the variation between the numerical and the analytical calculation. And this is what I put here. So as you can see, there is a very good agreement between the analytic and the numerical calculations. And I want to stress out the fact that we managed to reach such a high precision uh, thanks to a proper tuning of the precision control option implemented in Mathematica. So a second code test was to calculate again the angular diameter distance and the rest shift, but this time the Sagerish model. So in order to test the codes also in a more, let's say, complicated uh, uh, metric. Uh, for this other test, we want to calculate the variation between the numerical calculation of the observables within the BGO uh, formulas and the numerical calculation, but this time implementing the Sachs equations. As expected, we have a good agreement between uh, the observables calculated in these two methods, stating the fact that the BGO formalism is uh, completely equivalent to the Sachs formalism when we want to calculate such a classical observables. Okay, so as I said before, uh, one of the, of the advantage of the uh, BGO formalism is that we can extract many more observables within the same formalism, within the same framework. Uh, so here I will show you how is it possible to calculate the redshift drift in the Lambda CDM model uh, using the BGOs. So this is the general formula for the uh, redshift drift in terms of the BGO that are contained in this capital U, uh, uh, which is a, a block matrix where the blocks are essentially combinations of BGOs. So on the left, I'm plotting the, uh, the, um, the redshift drift as a function of the redshift. And this is, is, and this is the typical shape of the uh, redshift drift in the Lambda CPM model. While on the right, I am plotting the variation between the numerical and the analytical calculation. And as you can see, uh, the big light did it uh, correctly, again, up to 10 to the minus 24. Okay, so as an application of the Beagle Light package, I will show you how it is possible to isolate nonlinearities in light propagation. So uh, let's start saying that the, the effects of inhomogeneities on light propagation was heavily studied in the past by many authors uh, to, uh, uh, um, to explain uh, the, the observed accelerated expansion of the universe and also to evaluate possible bias on cosmological parameters. Uh, the conclusion are that, uh, that we believe that the effects of inhomogeneities on light propagation are too weak to explain the observed distance redshift relation without invoking any dark energy. And also that the effects of inhomogeneities on cosmological uh, parameters are uh, much smaller than the um, experimental precision. Of course, with, uh, with our big old light package, we don't expect to find something different, uh, but still together with the presenting the code, we want to see uh, what are the uh, contribution to the nonlinearities from uh, coming from different approximation when we calculate uh, the cosmological observables. 
And we want to see whether this investigation is consistent with previous results in the, in the literature. Okay, so let's try to get into it. And um, so for our analysis, we, we, we considered a model of the universe con containing world inhomogeneities, meaning where the matter is, uh, is di uniformly distributed along parallel planes, as is presented here in this picture. Uh, the free function of, the, of this model is the, um, the gravitational potential, which essentially set up the distribution of the uh, matter. Uh, here we consider the, the form of the plane parallel metric give, uh, in synchronous co-moving gauge, as presented in this article by Villa Matares and mine in 2011. And where the, the metric components are given in post-Newtonian um, expansion. So the core of the study, as I said before, is to compare cosmological observables like the redshift, the distances, and the drift effects uh, calculated at different approximations. And in particular, we will consider it, uh, the following three cases. The first case is when we take just the Newtonian part of the plane parallel metric and we uh, calculate uh, cosmological observables exactly using the big life package. The second case is when we take the post-Newtonian uh, plane parallel metric as an exact metric and we calculate observables exactly. And the third case is when we expand the, the plane parallel metric up to linear standard perturbation theory and we use this metric to calculate um, the, the linear cosmological observables. Okay, so uh, now I will show you some of the pre preliminary results of this analysis. Uh, these results are obtained considering a sinusoidal profile for the gravitational potential, where this K here essentially set up, gives the scale of the homogeneities, while A uh, gives the amplitude and is set such uh, giving the, the density contrast, the value of the density contrast today. Uh, for these results, we consider that the observer receives the light along the uh, bisect direction to the planes, and also that the observer is placed in a region with vanishing density contrast initial. So we calculated the uh, observables uh, for different values of the uh, inhomogeneity scales and amplitudes, but here I will show you just two cases. The first case is when k is equal to 500 megaparsec and the amplitude is such that the maximum of the density contrast is equal to 0 0.1 today. And the second case is with uh, inhomogeneities on scale of 100 megaparsec and amplitude such that the maximum of the density contrast is equal to 1 today. So uh, the first set of results concern the calculation of the redshift at different approximation. And in particular, I will show you the variation between the linear and the Newtonian redshift and the variation between the post-Newtonian and Newtonian. And these variations are calculated as, as shown here. In red, we have the variation calculated for inhomogeneities on scale of 500 megaparsec, while in blue we have the case with k equal 100 megaparsec. And as you, as you can see, uh, the variation calculated for scale, for inhomogeneities on scale of 500 megaparsec are always smaller than the variation on 100 megaparsec. Um, more importantly, uh, we, we have to notice that the variation post-Newtonian versus Newtonian are at least three orders of magnitude smaller than the variation linear versus Newtonian, implying the fact that the post-Newtonian just give uh, to a small correction to the uh, calculation of the redshift, and that the nonlinearity is mainly contained to the, into the Newtonian approximation. So the second set of results uh, concern the calculation of the angular limiter distance at different approximation. And here I have decided to group in the same plot the variation linear versus Newtonian and post-Newtonian versus Newtonian and to plot separately the variation linear versus post-Newtonian. So the reason of my choice is to highlight the fact that the variation linear Newtonian, post-Newtonian and Newtonian are very close between them. 
with a variation of the order of 10 to the minus 5 and some differences for the scales. Uh, but more importantly, we can see that the variation linear versus post-Newtonian is at least one order of magnitude smaller than the previous two other variations. And from, the, from this, we can conclude that the post-Newtonian angular diameter distance is much closer to its linear approximation than to the Newtonian one. So, well, we can summarize the results saying that for the redshift, the Newtonian approximation is the leading order for the nonlinearities, while for the angular diameter distance, we saw that the linear, the Newtonian angular diameter distance differs by 10 to the minus 5 from the linear and uh, the post-Newtonian angular diameter distance. So future uh, investigation will, uh, will be done considering different geodesic direction and also uh, varying the, um, the perturbation scales and profiles and, uh, and also the position of the observer. And we also plan to, to redo the same analysis, but this time changing the, the gauge choice and also including other observables like the redshift and position drift. Okay, so we reached the end of uh, my presentation and I hope I was able to, to show you that the BGO provides a unified framework to study light propagation and that can be used to extract all possible uh, op optical observables and also that the BGO light package is a valid numerical tool for studying light propagation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, wait, sorry. I need to stop the stream first. Yeah. In the second session, we'll have, um, First, Daniel Price and then Haley, uh, who have been both working together um, in uh, Monash University in Melbourne. So it's our great pleasure to have them talk today. And uh, let's start with start with Daniel, uh, if you want to take it away. Thanks, Julian and Haley, for the invitation to give a talk. Um, and it's great to meet some of you. Uh, this is not my main area of research, as you might have gathered. Um, so I, I really, this is actually the first time I've given a talk on this topic, despite um, a fair bit of work with Hayley, but we've left most of the talking to Hayley. And so I hope I don't steal any of her thunder. <laughs> uh, but I also thought I'd just take the opportunity to give um, a sense of some of our motivations for getting into this kind of work. Um, and some of those ideas I would categorise as crazy and some I think are perfectly, you know, uh, normal, sensible things to do. So. Um, I'm interested in your feedback, uh, but let's let's hopefully kick off an interesting discussion at least on why you might want to uh, solve Einstein's equations more directly in cosmology. Uh, so why would we want to do this? I mean, Einstein's equations are difficult enough. Why would you want to, for example, use numerical relativity to try and solve um, the evolution of the universe? Well, first of all, one of the simple reasons is just it's possible. So numerical relativity is a pretty mature field now. Um, you know, the techniques uh, didn't exist 10 years ago um, to do, or 15 years ago to do numerical relativity stably and accurately, and that's now possible. And I was just curious to me that actually there wasn't really anyone, um, when we started out at least, uh, who uh, really had a go at even just doing the most basic things like um, checking analytic solutions. So. The next most useful reason is is to just to check your approximations. Obviously, the nice thing about numerical relativity, although you make approximations in the numerical scheme, you don't make any assumptions about terms being large or small in Einstein's equations, and you don't make any assumptions about speeds of light being small or, or fields being weak or anything like that. Um, perhaps a more sort of high level motivation is this problem known as the averaging problem, which I sort of phrase more or less like the universe doesn't really know what its average density is. Um, so even if FLRW is the correct description of the universe's evolution, you know, how does it know at the present day time, you know, what the mean density is and therefore like, you know, effectively what the time is or um, 
in the cosmological model. Um, on the sort of more crazy end, um, these things have kind of been proposed. Uh, so this solutions to this averaging problem have been proposed as an alternative explanation for accelerating expansion. So the simple view of that, um, and I'll go into a bit more detail, but would basically be the universe is kind of becoming more void dominated um, as time goes on. So um, in some way that looks like a sort of apparent acceleration, even though um, there's not really an accelerating expansion. Um, I'll talk a bit about the emergence of curvature. So sort of net curvature may be an issue there as well. Um, but you know, more sort of sensible thing to do, you know, obviously if you solve the equations of general relativity, then you can um, look at a particular region of space and you can see how fast it's expanding and therefore explore uh, just local variations of the Hubble constant in a self-consistent manner. Um, and probably the most sensible reason is just what we've uh, heard this morning from Christian and others, but is that something sensible you really want to do is to see if any of these next order general relativistic effects are potentially detectable. Um, and that's just interesting because, you know, we want to understand more about relativity, especially on large scales. I'm just going to unplug my headphones actually, so I can hear myself talking without being loud. All right, so let's just um, refresh you on what you should hopefully know already. Um, but when we're talking about cosmology, we're usually talking about the friedman lemaitre robson walker metric. So that just means take, uh, assume that the universe is a uniform density, sort of infinite medium, um, which means write the metric in the following form. Uh, so the cosmological principle is obviously that this is a good description of the universe because the universe is homogeneous and ice trophy on large scales. All right, so some sort of metric uh, in the three spaces. So that could be uh, with curvature, if you have some net curvature or just flat space, if, if you're taking a flat geometry. So the basic gist of it is you stick this metric into Einstein's equations and you can find the analog solution. Of course, that's known as the Friedman equations. Um, so a lot of this talk about sort of averaging and back reaction comes back to analogies with the Friedman equations. So these are just for a dust universe here. So I've um, dropped all terms related to pressure. Uh, but one of the interesting terms is obviously if the universe has curvature, that introduces an additional term on the right hand side here. Um, so a lot of discussion about averaging in cosmology is whether this solution to Einstein's equations, assuming homogeneity and isotropy, is a good description for the real universe or not. Um, and the answer is, well, yes, definitely at early times. Uh, if we look at something like the cosmic microwave background that tells us exactly what the universe was like, you know, 300,000 years or so after the Big Bang. Uh, and so we know that not only is the the Friedman Lemaitre Robson Walker metric a good description of the universe, we also know some extra things. So, for example, uh, the power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background tells us the universe is very, very close to flat geometry at this early time. And it also tells us, uh, gives us a on the uh, constant or the expansion rate of the universe. So we can actually, you know, basically solve for the things we need in the Friedman equations um, very accurately. Now, there's some interesting discrepancies that have arisen the last few years, and we're going to come back to this a bit as well. Um, one of which is if you measure the Hubble constant um, from the cosmic microwave background, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Yeah, we can. Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah. yeah. I'm assuming that's a yes. We can. Daniel, I think your headphones well, are... Well, so if you measure, you know, <laughs> uh, the Planck measurement of the Hubble constant gives you a value of something like 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But if you take sort of measurements based on local distance estimates, so type 1 supernovae or various other methods, then you tend to land an answer which is more or less um, 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And the source of this discrepancy is not currently well understood. And the error bars have now become significant enough that this is a pretty serious discrepancy at, at the sort of five sigma level. Um, so, well, that's one of the motivations. Well, it would be interesting therefore to look at say, local variations in the Hubble constant to see if um, in a more, in a full relativistic model to see if uh, we might explain this discrepancy. Accelerating expansion, of course, uh, is a bit of a mystery. So you can't explain accelerating expansion with the FLRW metric with just a density, um, just some normal matter density. So you require something basically like a negative matter density uh, in order to cause this expansion to accelerate. 
And so you can see, for example, uh, back in the original Reese and Perlmutter papers that, you know, trying to fit in a, a, a universe with no sort of dark energy component gives you a pretty, um, well, def definitely a discrepant fit to the actual expansion rate of the universe. So obviously, oh, well, this is a Nobel Prize and it motivated, um, well, we still actually don't understand the reason for this. Uh, so in terms of dark energy, uh, what do we do? Well, we actually modify Einstein's equations. So the metric is the same, but there's a modification to Einstein's equations that gives you the famous cosmological constant. Uh, and that gives you these kind of modified Freeman equations with the extra lambda term. Now, um, I guess we're going to come back to this, but that's potentially where the averaging stuff gets interesting because basically any, any kind of additional term on the right-hand side of Friedman's equations um, could potentially replace this lambda term. So lambda is just an additional term on the right-hand side of both of the Friedman equations. Um, and so any sort of additional effect you might get from inhomogeneities, for example, if that were to appear as an additional term on the right-hand side, then potentially it's an explanation for, um, for some dark energy or accelerating expansion. Um, the other thing that could look a little bit like that is, is any kind of net curvature. Um, so in general, this Ricci scalar thing is um, well, is a negative quantity. Uh, so that's basically a positive term, uh, the second term in the first Friedman equation. Um, and so potentially that could also give you some sort of what you might call a back reaction effect. Uh, so there, of course, the other way to think about dark energy is as a term on uh, the right hand side of Einstein's equations instead of on the left. So that gives you something more like a negative pressure rather than a sort of extra form of energy. But however you want to think about it, um, that's how we currently explain accelerating expansion. Uh, so the kind of the interesting side about this for why you know, homogeneities might be might play a role here is that you can play the same sort of game, uh, but if you start just taking averages of quantities um, on certain volumes in the universe, I mean this um, is of course the work of the Bukert group, and you run those things through Einstein's equations, you can produce something that looks a lot like the Friedman equations. Uh, but instead of having like the, you know, really the, you know, density of a homogeneous isotropic universe, you have some average density, um, you know, averaged on some local volume um, appearing on the right hand side. And the interesting thing that's been pointed out uh, by this group in particular is that you can have terms that what they call these back reaction terms that appear on the right hand side. Now, um, well, so obviously the implication here um, is that potentially these Q terms, which is called the back reaction, which is basically related to motions. So it's related to, um, you know, shear and uh, vorticity and things like that, um, which is basically the motion of structure. Um, but the idea is, you know, these look an awful lot like lambda essentially. And so if you could find um, that these terms were large enough to give you um, the amount of, uh, can away with dark energy. Kind of the like totally moonshot side of this. Uh, there's another term here, of course, which is the net curvature. And so just as you saw in the, the Friedman equation, there's a kind of term which is rather than just being the actual curvature of a homogeneous isotropic universe, it's something like the net curvature, um, which again could play a role in making the the um, the evolution of the universe's expansion differ from what you might expect from a flat um, Friedman universe. But the problem with this sort of averaging scheme is we haven't really done anything um, that enables us to solve these equations. Now, obviously, I could make up, um, you know, certain contributions of Q, just like you can invent, you know, amounts of dark energy. Uh, but it doesn't really tell me whether that describes the real universe. And in particular, um, the Bukert formulation is basically just a reformulation of Einstein's equations averaged on some local volume. And so in this kind of formulation, you have no way of actually determining what this value of Q actually is. Um, and likewise, you know, the sort of net curvature. Um, so it's very difficult unless you have some kind of, well, what you need actually is a solution of Einstein's equations. So that was one of our sort of ideas here is, well, if we just actually solve Einstein's equations numerically, then we can simply basically read off these terms on the right hand side and you can see whether these things are important or not. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, could back reaction be important? It's a pretty um, contentious topic and I'm probably not going to do justice to it in the space of this talk. 
But, you know, it's pretty clear the present day universe, so Redshift Zero universe is highly non-uniform. Um, and, you know, the idea is therefore that maybe the evolution of um, the average here is not quite the same as the average evolution. Therefore, like a Friedman universe may not be the right description for what's going on in the present day universe. Now, this is a very slippery argument um, and I've done my best to represent it, but there's, there's some, you know, pretty uh, useful criticisms and, you know, I guess this is boiled down to a bit of an argument in the literature about um, whether whether you can do this or not, take a sort of bumpy universe and kind of smooth it out on some scale to give um, a less bumpy universe. So the analogy, um, well, so the main objection to this is basically from this green and wild group. Um, and they just simply say, well, imagine you're living on a billiard ball. Um, so, you know, on very large scales, this billiard ball is perfectly smooth and you can totally find the metric um, that describes it. You know, but if you zoom in on smaller and smaller scales and eventually you're going to see, you know, little um, imperfections in the billion ball. And if you zoom in even further on these scales, you can find yourself in these like highly non-uniform local structures. Uh, but the point they make in these papers is quite interesting, which is basically that um, even if that's true, so this is basically the same argument as structure formation in the real universe that on these small scales, you have all these inhomogeneities, but nevertheless, it's a reasonably well-defined procedure to try to find what that global metric is. Um, and so, you know, basically then the perturbation theory is a perfectly valid approach to, you know, finding the formation of structure, uh, which is of course how we currently do cosmology. So basically nothing to see here, um, everybody should move along. Um, there's been some, a lot of, well, some response to this in the literature, which is also um, contentious. So I'm not going to really delve into that. Um, but you know, there's other problems, right? So uh, as I've already mentioned, you know, one of the problems with averaging is these equations don't by themselves don't tell you very much. I mean, they tell you something that might be interesting, um, but you actually can't determine this Q. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the criticisms is without knowing Q, you can sort of make arbitrary claims about how large these back reaction terms might be. Um, and, well, the other problem is if, you know, if you invent an arbitrary Q, you don't know that the solution you found actually solves Einstein's equations or not, uh, because, you know, you have to solve Einstein's equations to determine Q. Um, and more importantly, uh, actually, when you're doing this sort of spatial averaging, you have to be careful as well. Uh, because it depends on the choice of hypersurface. So, um, you know, obviously averaging over space implies a kind of three plus one splitting, but you've got some sort of time dimension and you've got some sort of spatial plane over which to average, uh, which obviously depends on where you choose your observer or who you choose your observer B and GR. Um, so, you know, this has been a pretty thorny issue. Um, and I know there's some people in the audience who've worked on it about, you know, exactly how you do averaging in a sort of sensible way. Um, in GR. You know, so uh, one of the answers might be, well, why don't we just use perturbation theory? I mean, this is basically how we currently do cosmology. Uh, and is there anything wrong with it? So um, one of the arguments I actually just want to pick up, and again, it's been addressed in the literature, so this is not a new argument, but it's just this argument that perturbations are small and therefore we shouldn't care about them. Um, and my take on this is just simply that you can say the same argument about the Friedman metric itself. Uh, so, I mean, Christian, for example, was showing us, you know, some plots of the Newtonian potential phi. Uh, and if you calculate the magnitude of the Newtonian potential, uh, it's tiny. It's 10 to the minus 5 um, compared to 1. So on that basis, you would simply say that uh, we can neglect phi and it's completely irrelevant. Uh, but the reason it's not because, um, you know, phi has you know, large derivatives and that gives you a large local curvature. So, you know, if you're living in that part of the billiard ball, you know, where the curvature is large, um, you know, although phi is a, you know, it's still a good approximation to take phi as a perturbation, um, the fact that, you know, you have large local gradients can significantly change, you know, what happens to me if I'm a little miniature ant on a, on a billiard ball, I really care about those local variations. Um, and so it's important to think about small corrections in the right way because small corrections um, to the metric can have very large effects on what happens to your geodesics. Um, so for example, that's what we mean here. So phi is small, uh, but you know, two, 
two uh, geodesics that have you know slightly different values of phi, one will fall into the potential and one will won't. So they'll have completely different trajectories. And that's the same argument for something like the perihelion precession of Mercury. So you might, you might, for example, argue that frame dragging is small in the solar system. But of course, uh, if you watch Mercury's orbit for many centuries, then you would get it quite wrong if you don't include that general relativistic correction. Um, sorry, not frame dragging, the, you know, the Schwarzschild precession of Mercury, uh, which is also a small effect. But actually, the frame dragging effect is a, another small effect on top of that, um, which is kind of what we're talking about now in cosmology. So that goes back to sort of the question I asked Christian earlier, which is, um, you know, even though the frame dragging correction, which is this next vector potential correction in the metric, is small, it's important to understand whether that has uh, any kind of impact on, you know, what happens to your GDs and is that measurable in any way in the real universe? Uh, again, because the same reason is that phi is a small correction to the metric, but because it causes an instability, namely the genes instability, it has a very large effect on what happens in the universe. Uh, but not in the sense that the metric's necessarily a bad description, but just in the sense that it does change the outcome in terms of you know having people like us walking around on planets like the Earth. Um, of course, it's been argued that, well, there's actually a, a mathematical theorem that there's no back reaction in the Newtonian limit. So that kind of rules out discussing back reaction if you're using perturbation theory of first order. Um, and basically by others, it's been mainly argued that back reaction would enter by the sort of tensor modes, which is in this HIJ type term. So if you're going to address these kind of larger questions about whether there's global contributions from back reaction, you would need to go to pretty high order in your perturbation theory. Now, that's not impossible, um, but, um, well, it's uh, not, I mean, it's, it doesn't mean it's invalid. So, again, just this visual thing about, you know, small perturbations can have big consequences, um, and this is, you know, the same thing with the formation of structure. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't do this, um, but, you know, these small corrections to the metric may have important influences on what happens in the evolution of the universe. Uh, so, you know, as we know, structure formation can be done perfectly well in a sort of perturbative framework. All right, um, so the other sort of final sort of motivation here um, is that some work from Christoph Baleko, um, who's a sort of colleague of ours a few years ago, uh, he made some simulations of sort of structure, from, some sort of toy models of structure formation in the universe using uh, what you call the silent universe approximation. Uh, but basically, he found something interesting, which is he could, um, under, while he found uh, these back reaction terms to be very small, he did find under certain circumstances that you could have the kind of emergence of sort of net curvature in the universe. And as I mentioned earlier, that's potentially interesting because it can sort of play the same role on the right-hand side of your Friedman equations as a term that can kind of change the sort of net um, expansion rate of the universe. Um, and so in Christoph's model, there's some issues. So he used a relatively simple approximation, a silent universe approximation. Um, and he seemed to link, at least in his initial... Uh, to the formation of realized halos. Uh, so I'm going to come back to this, but um, you know, it's something that might be interesting to look at in the context of a more um, self-consistent GR model. So that was kind of some of the broader motivations um, and some of the things that were sort of existing at the time. Um, and so our thoughts about how to resolve all this was, well, why don't we just try and do it directly? So just um, what, why can't we just solve Einstein's equations directly using numerical relativity? And so, of course, that's what we tried to do. Um, as I mentioned, it kind of turned out to be more, um, I guess it was less well-trodden than I had imagined. So simple things like let's evolve a Friedman universe, you know, in a periodic box with numerical relativity hadn't really been done. There was a sort of old preprints from uh, 10 years ago, but nothing really properly published. Um, but, you know, a bit of work later, thanks to Haley, um, you know, and this sort of stuff, you know, works fine. Um, so it gave us a sort of green light for going a little bit further. And the next sort of step from just does Friedman work is, you know, let's look at just sort of analytic solutions. So linear perturbation theory, if we take a sort of single mode in a box um, and let this universe expand, you know, does our mode grow at the correct rate according to linear perturbation theory? And the answer is well, yes. 
you know, and then you can start to think about, well, you know, once we go nonlinear, then what can you see from the GR that isn't predicted by linear perturbation theory, for example? Um, and I know uh, Julian Adamek and others have been looking at similar questions. Uh, you know, so for example, one of the things you could look at is this um, gravitational slip, it's called. So this difference between the two scalar potentials, which is zero at linear order um, in linear perturbation theory. Uh, but once you start to get beyond linear order, so once this sort of little mode becomes nonlinear, then you get some sort of non-zero gravitational slip. So again, you know, as expected, these kind of effects are small, um, but gravitational slip, there's a sort of interesting discussion in this Birchinger paper about, you know, maybe there's a sort of measurable thing there. Um, and it's basically a difference between, because it's the difference between the G naught naught part of the metric and the GIJ part of the metric, it's a difference between basically how, um, you know, relativistic things behave. So like light propagation compared to, you know, um, more normal matter. So potentially there's some observable consequence of gravitational slip being non-zero at the sort of 10 to minus um, five or six level. Um, you know, so you can go from there to something like a sort of mini toy universe. And so we did that. Uh, and again, you know, there's, been some comeback on this literature, um, we were just trying to, you know, sh show that numerical relativity gives you something like structure formation. Um, and of course, uh, well, this goes back to this discussion about whether linear perturbation theory is valid. Um, it's a perfectly valid approach, um, you know, to, to do perturbation theory. And um, as a result, other people have shown you can get exactly the same results with, or, or more or less exactly the same. I have to flip the color bar um, and flip the the images just to give us the right, um, the same setup here. So I apologize that all the labels are upside down, but that's how they plotted them in the paper. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't mean that the perturbation theory is invalid, but it's nice to see that you can get this from like sort of no assumption solutions of Einstein's equation. So this is like a collapse of a kind of filament here. Uh, so this is the, uh, over, the over density to, in the initial conditions and it collapses to make this sort of filament and you know, sort of void type structure. Uh, I mean, that's all very sort of toy model. So with that sort of in the can, we, we wanted to go a little bit further and say, well, can we do anything that's sort of more realistic in terms of actually making cosmological structures? And so that's where sort of Haley set to work trying to model something like the real universe. And again, you know, this has been done um, for many years in, in a sort of more standard approach. Um, so a little bit of rethinking is required because you have to solve, be careful about your initial conditions. Uh, but basically, um, we just use linearized equations to generate initial conditions um, consistent with the matter power spectrum from the cosmic microwave background, um, you know, and that satisfies Einstein's equation. So rather than simply having just the gravitational potential, you have to have the density fluctuation, the gravitational potential, and the velocity has to be set up in the initial conditions as well. So again, these, you know, these the sort of motions are 10 to minus 6 of the speed of light. But then you can basically hit go on the code from there with a lot of hard work from Haley. Um, so we're obviously doing this on a grid. So that is a big approximation. Um, but we just wanted to see, I guess, how far we can push things um, and whether we could do anything realistic. So essentially what we did is just take some equation of state um, and try to sort of minimize the pressure. So we took some P equals K or squared and basically tried to make sure that the pressure was negligible uh, without the code crashing. Um, and so this was done in the Einstein toolkit. And again, if you want to know the details, like Haley's a person, she knows all of the details. Um, but basically this sort of approach seems to work reasonably well um, within its limitations. So you can take something like the cosmic micro background kind of redshift with these linearized perturbations. And you can evolve them into full general relativity. So these are the density perturbations in a slice of the midplane up to something like redshift zero. Now, just another limitation in this approach. Um, now, obviously our universe is not quite correct here because um, we actually didn't modify Einstein's equation. So we didn't have any dark energy term in the kind of um, the Einstein's equations that we're solving here. So we did basically an omega matter equals one universe, um, which is a bit of a toy approximation to the real universe. but you can still say some, you know, reasonably meaningful things. Um, and so with that done, I mean, what's nice is you can then go in and just read off the things you're interested in. So for example, if you're interested in the, you know, the scalar curvature or local variations in the Hubble parameter, or, um, you know, your sort of cosmic web, then they're all there in your simulation. Um, and you can probe, um, you know, sort of true numerical experiment kind of sense, uh, whatever you want to look at. Um, 
So, you know, we didn't have time to do as much as we would have liked. Um, thankfully, Haley's now got time to do many more things. But the things we did manage to look at, you know, were some of these uh, basic questions we had in the first place. So, for example, um, if we try to make average, these sort of average quantities, um, then perhaps it's not surprising, but, you know, when you average on sufficiently large scales, we find, you know, basically consistent with what we put in, that you get omega matter equals zero. So, you know, um, universes can you, can you check, can universe you give we started with. Um, and that there's no sort of net curvature that pops out of this. Um, and also basically the back reaction is essentially zero to our measurement errors um, on the largest scales in the simulation. So just going back to the question of whether, you know, there's any significant back reaction, at least in our simulations, the answer was like basically no. So this is um, showing you as a function of time or redshift here. You know, so this is on different spatial scales. But basically omega matter is one, which means, you know, there's no deviation from Friedman universe here. Um, you know, and the sort of deviations that you might expect from these additional terms, like um, this sort of net curvature and the back reaction type terms, um, are at this sort of level of maybe 10 to the minus eight, uh, where there may be a gotcha for, you know, they might be growing and the result of these terms depends a bit on numerical resolutions. So um, there's maybe a bit of room, a bit of wriggle room here. Actually, one of the wriggle rooms uh, turns out to be, again, you have to be careful about how you do this averaging. So I believe Haley's going to give an update on that in the next um, in the next minute or two. I'm just trying to check the chat for some time. I'm running out of time. So right, I'm nearly there. Um, you know, so again, this, looking at these local variations in the Hubble constant, um, you know, our variance uh, is more or less what you'd expect from a Newtonian cosmological simulation. So unfortunately, that means that, you know, if you start averaging on these sort of hundreds of megaparsec scales, the kind of variance you get um, in the Hubble expansion is far too small to explain this kind of Hubble constant discrepancy. Um, but, you know, it's this consistent with what you find from sort of Newtonian simulation. So, Nothing particularly different here, but it's still nice to do it in the kind of full GR context. Our little postscript is actually that um, I'm not convinced this Hubble trouble is not due to cosmic variance. There seems to be a bit of a consensus emerging that one of the problems with the local measurements is that you actually anchor the distance measurements in quite small scale things. So there's a paper, for example, this year that suggests that part of the trouble might be that these local distance measurements, although the measurements out to 100 megaparsec, they're calibrated with more local distance indicators that are sort of anchored at these 40 megaparsec-ish scales. And at those scales, there's plenty of cosmic variance um, to help you um, solve this Hubble constant problem. And that also agrees with what you get from what you call these reverse distance ladder estimates. So if you start from the cosmic microwave background and work backwards, then you tend to find results that agree with the Planck measurement. So again, that sort of indicates that maybe there's just a calibration issue here about um, you know, the sort of our local void being a local void, but a relatively local one, but that sort of affects the distance measurements outwards. So um, I think the story is still rolling, but I think uh, it's still kind of interesting that there's plenty enough variance on smaller scales and that might be affecting the kind of forward measurements on over time. Wow. All right, so quickly then, what's missing? Well, we do the density on a grid, so that means we can't form virilized structures. Um, we haven't really done any synthet proper synthetic observations yet. Obviously, we don't include dark energy. I'm worried about the periodic box, because if you want to um, address this question about net curvature, then the periodic box kind of forces you to have net curvature zero. So it's like saying, if I start tiling the Earth with squares, I'm always going to get um, flat. I'm basically enforcing a flat geometry. Um, all right, so just conclusions then. Um, basically, using GR means you can directly measure some of these things. We found pretty negligible back reaction, and everything we've found so far is consistent with perturbation theory being a good approach. Um, and, you know, some interesting things on the Hubble tension. I'll leave some questions um, to be posed. It's interesting to see that some of these questions are already being answered. Uh, but I'll leave these up there for discussion. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, really nice uh, talk. Uh, we're a bit out of time. Um, Haley, do you anyway 
want to pause the uh, live stream for a minute. Okay, sorry, this is <laughs> for everyone waiting. It's just a long, it's a complicated process to get this going. So that's okay. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah, I think for me yes. it's fine. Okay, can... awesome. All right, so um, thank you very much. And thanks to Daniel for giving that um, introduction to our work. I'm now admitting that we probably should have chatted a bit more about what was going to be in, e in each of our talks. So there might be a little bit of repetition in the introduction, but that's that's OK. Um, so yeah, as Daniel said, we've been working on this for the um, last couple of years, doing my PhD with him and Paul Lasky at Monash University. And this is work that I'm continuing on in my fellowship here uh, in DAMPT at the University of Cambridge for the last year or so. And this is an extension of that work that I've been working on with Pierre Maria, who's also joining us at this workshop too. So uh, I don't think it would be very surprising to all of you when I say that we have a pretty good cosmological model uh, at the moment, which is our current standard cosmological model. And this is based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, and it's called the Lambda Cold Dark Matter or Lambda CDM model. And it's named this after the uh, main constituents of the universe that we have inferred from our cosmological observations. So what we see is this pie chart over here, which represents the current um, contents of the universe as we know it. So a large portion of this is in dark energy, which in the standard model is best described by a cosmological constant, hence lambda. And the second largest uh, constituent is dark matter. So matter that only interacts gravitationally and not with light. And in the standard model, this is best described as being cold or non-relativistic and hence CDM. So again, I don't think I need to convince anyone that this is a pretty good model and it's successful in explaining a whole lot of our cosmological observations in a surprisingly simple framework. So this is a very simplified look at the standard model, but um, the model itself is actually very, very simple. But in saying that, there are some interesting tensions between our cosmological observations and the standard model, which have uh, come to light as the precision of our observations becomes uh, well more precise. And of course, there's also this pesky 95% of the universe, which we can't quite explain just yet. So these two things uh, alone, I would say, are enough to motivate investigations into alternatives to Lambda CDM. Um, so a lot of people are looking into new physics beyond the standard model, and this includes things like modifications of general relativity. And uh, what I'm interested in, rather, and a lot of you are also interested in as well, is looking into existing physics that we know exists and we know is there, but is neglected or overlooked in the standard cosmological model. So. As I said, modern cosmology is based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, which is encapsulated in his famous field equations here. So these equations tell us that uh, space time and its curvature in the Einstein tensor G mu nu are intimately linked to the matter content of the universe in the stress energy tensor T mu nu on the right hand side. And so the equality between these two things really tells us that our lumpy universe in the matter will give us a lumpy space time beneath it. And these equations might look relatively simple, but uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know, they are really not that easy to solve. And so what is done in many areas of physics and in cosmology as well is to simplify them. And the way we normally do this is using some kind of symmetry. And specifically in cosmology, this symmetry are the assumptions that our universe is everywhere homogeneous and isotropic. And so this corresponds to the Freeman Lamentor Robinson Walker or FLRW model in general relativity. And this is the model that we use to uh, infer the, this, these constituents of the universe based on our observations. So this is justified by the fact that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic above a certain scale. And so we say that our universe is described by this FLRW model on average. So Daniel already gave a little bit of an introduction to these equations, but basically when we make these assumptions in general relativity, we get the Friedman equations which tell us how the density rho and the size, but given by the scale factor A of our homogeneous isotropic universe evolve over time. And also just want to point out the uh, constant global curvature K. So this is a parameter that describes the overall um, geometry of the universe and it's constant, sorry, everywhere in space and everywhere in time. 
So this is the model that's used in uh, most state-of-the-art cosmological simulations today. Uh, there are a few exceptions coming to light recently. But the way the, these generally work is using some kind of particle method to discretize the matter, the matter content. And these uh, collapse, these nonlinear structures collapse under the action of purely Newtonian gravity, which evolve on top of and completely separate to a background FLRW expanding universe. So what this means is that as we form these highly nonlinear structures in these simulations, this homogeneous background remains homogeneous and does not interact with, uh, its, with its matter and the matter does not feed back and interact with the surrounding space time. So what this means in uh, enforcing this background FLRW expansion is this requires to uh, smoothing over this highly nonlinear and complex matter field that we have in the late universe. And while taking the average of something that is described by a scalar field, like the density is relatively straightforward, if we want to describe the average dynamics of something that's described by tensors, like space-time, then uh, it's really not that simple. And so this process of smoothing here, um, so sorry, this is the same, this is the Millennium Simulation, which I showed on the previous slide as well, uh, from one of Chris Clarkson's papers now a while ago. Uh, these black and white boxes represent scales of 150 megaparsec, and uh, above this scale, this is on the scales on which our universe is homogeneous and isotropic. But the question is, um, when we do, in doing this process of smoothing uh, in the left to right and the bottom panels here, is the result we get out at the right hand side uh, in FLRW universe. And this is the assumption in, in modern cosmology is that once we smooth over this nonlinear field, uh, both the matter and the space time correspond and evolve like the FLRW model. But if we do this smoothing process in the context of nonlinear GR, uh, we don't necessarily get the same thing. And again, Daniel went over these equations a little bit uh, before. So I'm just going to give uh, a brief introduction to these as well. So the left hand side, we've got our homogeneous isotropic FLRW equations, and I'm going to make a direct comparison to the corresponding equations for an inhomogeneous universe. So these are uh, fully nonlinear GR averaged over a particular, uh, particular spatial domain. And this is featuring a perfect fluid and an observer that is co-moving with the fluid flow. So these two equations uh, look like this and they look quite similar. So let's just look through some similarities and differences. The scale factor is replaced by this effective scale factor AD, which is just the rate of change of the volume of our chosen domain, which is represented by this uh, subscript D. The density is just replaced by the average density within that domain. Uh, the cosmological constant is the same because it's a constant. And one of the main differences is the curvature, um, which in the FLW model, as I said, is constrained to be uh, fixed everywhere in space and time. But in the inhomogeneous model, this curvature is free to and does evolve over time. So, and the, the other, the main difference, as we notice, is we have an, actually have a whole extra term on the right-hand side in the inhomogeneous evolution. And this term arises exactly because averaging and time evolution in nonlinear GR do not commute, and so we end up with an extra term, which is zero in the FLRW assumption. And so this is, this is uh, arising because we're smoothing over the small-scale structures, which uh, feeds back and affects the large-scale averaged evolution of the universe. So obviously these two equations are not the same. There are some differences. And so in order for them to coincide or for the assumptions of modern cosmology to be correct, that the average of our universe always coincides with FLRW, what we need is for this extra term QD to be identically zero. And we also need our average curvature to go something like the FLRW constant K. And I do just want to stress that this is by no means a new idea and the back reaction of small scale structures on the average evolution has been studied for decades, uh, mainly in the context of things like perturbation theory and post-Newtonian expansions and exact toy models. And the results of these studies do span a really large range and they range from completely describing dark energy and dark matter to being completely negligible. So I don't think there's much question that this is a really important thing to, to look into in more detail. And this has uh, been a really hot topic of debate for about 40 years or so. So it's by no means uh, solved. But the issue with this is if we want to answer this question, which is does the average of our universe always coincide with the FLRW model, uh, we need to actually calculate these things um, by evolving and averaging a fully inhomogeneous and isotropic universe um, and evolve it through to low redshift. So when we have these really complex structures that we see today with no simplifying assumptions to really get a full picture of how, this, of how big this effect really is. So to do this, what we need is numerical relativity. And so I did give a bit of an introduction in, in my technical 
my technical talk on the Einstein Toolkit and FLRW Solver, and Christian also gave a nice introduction to to the uh, three plus one formalism of numerical relativity in his talk as well. So do check that out for more details. But I'm just going to give a bit of an overview about the inhomogeneous cosmology edition um, of numerical relativity. So as Eloisa says, said, uh, numerical relativity has been used for cosmology for a while, uh, but with, for the first time using uh, numerical relativity with no assumptions for the, for the gravitational field and no, sim no symmetries in, in the, any of the dimensions, the first time this was done was in uh, 2016. So that was with uh, Jim Merton's group, who I think is joining us now, or he will be talking after lunch. Um, so in these papers here, and that code Cosmograph was developed uh, specifically for simulating inhomogeneous cosmology in numerical relativity. And then uh, we've really got everyone with us here today because Aloisa Ventavegna and Marco Bruni are also joining us now, who used the Einstein Toolkit, um, which is the code we'll use for the tutorials if you're sticking around. So, but they use it in a different way to, to how we used it a little bit later. So they use Eloise's uh, Cosmo Toolkit thorns to do a dust evolution and we do things a little bit differently. Um, so this is really great and even since then there are a few groups who have come up in this field as well. They don't have uh, pretty pictures or a code name just yet so I can't advertise them the same. And of course this work has been, uh, investigations into GRs is, is not a new thing either. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, specifically uh, with Julian's work and many others, I'm sure, as well, in, uh, in G-evolution. And what Christian told us about earlier this morning in, in Gramsci's as well. So both of these, these works do currently have some approximation, reasonable approximations for the gravitational field at the moment. So again, please do check out the, the technical talk on the Einstein Toolkit and FLRW Solver with the link in the Slack channel ET tutorial for more details on this. But just to touch on it, as I said, we use the Einstein Toolkit, which is a, a really widely used free and open source code uh, based on the Cactus infrastructure. So this was initially built for numerical relativity, but has since been extended to a bunch of other purposes as well. And the numerical relativity um, part of it is now rolled into the Einstein Toolkit. So we developed our thorn called FLRW Solver, which just initializes your cosmological space time and then sends it into the Einstein Toolkit and uses all of the regular run of the mill evolution thorns for that. So you can check out this paper, which Daniel did talk about a little bit for our code tests and boring FLRW um, evolutions and some single mode linear evolutions as well. So again, Daniel did touch on this too, but just a few words about the, um, the way we make our initial conditions. So what we want is to look at GR effects in our own universe. So ideally we would have a simulation that best represents what our universe looks like or as, as well as we can. So we use the, the matter power spectrum of fluctuations in the CMB. So that's this dashed curve here, which we get output from CAM. Uh, and then we just sample a Gaussian random field of fluctuations that follows this power spectrum. And we can see this blue curve is showing the section of the power spectrum that we sample given our largest simulation. So this is a gigaparsec on a side with a resolution of 256 cubed. And this is what those density perturbations look like on the right hand side, where the, the red regions are overdense, the blue are underdense. Oh, sorry. Blue are under dense and the green is the um, background FLRW uh, because in our initial conditions, I was meant to mention this, we do assume that the perturbations are linear and are perturbed around an FLRW background, so a flat FLRW background. Um, however, it's as soon as the simulation starts, we don't have any strict assumption of a background cosmology um, or FLRW at all. So when we put these initial conditions into the Einstein toolkit, uh, this is what the evolution looks like. So here we can see the effective redshift in the top right hand corner. And what we're looking at here is the column density, so the density integrated into and out of the page in the line of sight here. And we've got a pretty good uh, uh, recognizable cosmic web coming out of this at the end. But the good thing about this is that this also comes with all of the information about the underlying inhomogeneous and isotropic space time beneath it as well. So there are a lot of things that we can do with this, um, these simulations, and uh, Daniel has given a pretty good introduction to what we have actually done with it so far. But basically, uh, what all we've done at the moment is really look at the average dynamics of these inhomogeneous cosmologies. And to do this, as, as I mentioned briefly before, this means we need to choose a spatial slice over which to average. And uh, the obvious kind of first choice to do is just to use the same slice that we need, that we, that we use for our simulation, because the numerical relativity also requires a three plus one split. So that seems like a natural way to, to start this. So I mentioned before that the, uh, the original um, back reaction formalism of uh, Thomas Bukert and others was developed in the co-moving gauge. 
So all I mean by this is that our observers are everywhere co-moving with the fluid. So this plot here shows uh, a breakdown of a two plus one um, split of a three-dimensional manifold M. So we need to add one dimension for our own universe, but that's difficult to draw four dimensions. So we're just going with two plus one. So we've split this three-dimensional manifold M into a series of two-dimensional spatial slices. And each one of these at a particular point in time. And N here is the, um, the normal to these surfaces. So all we mean when we say co-moving is that this normal coincides with the four velocity, or in this case, the three velocity of the fluid itself. And so these sheets represent our families of observers. However, these can't, this um, frame is actually quite tricky for nonlinear simulations of structure formation in numerical relativity. And the reason for this is that as our nonlinear structures collapse, our four velocities uh, point inwards towards each other. And um, as the matter falls into our overdense regions. And what this means is that when our structures are nonlinear, these um, we can no longer define, at, sorry, our smooth surface of family of co-moving observers is no longer well defined. And eventually if we have shell crossings, uh, we cannot um, create these slices at all anymore. So what we do instead is just the obvious alternative, which is the non-co-moving gauge. So all we do is we just have our family of observers in our simulation and therefore in our averaging are just kind of randomly floating in space with some different velocity to the, to the four velocity of the fluid U. And this makes things a lot easier for our um, simulations of nonlinear structure formation. So um, a little summary of, of, again, what we've done, which Daniel told us about, is we use this formalism, this averaging formalism of Bucher, generalized to an arbitrary foliation. So these kind of non-co-moving non gauges that, that we need for our simulations. And basically what we found was that when we ca calculate averages over this whole domain, so over our entire periodic domain, we found the total contribution of back reaction and average curvature was really, really tiny, it was about 10 to the minus eight. However, we did find um, much larger effects on small scales. So looking above the homogeneity scale, we found effects of around a few percent, and this went up to 10% uh, or larger on scales below the homogeneity scale. <clears throat> so check out this paper if you're interested in more detailed results on that. Um, however, the main focus of the results I'm going to talk about in this talk is uh, based on a new formalism by Thomas Bucher, Pierre Mourier, and Xavier Roy, which was put out uh, late last year, uh, which showed that some of these formalisms, uh, including one of the ones that we used, was rather than looking at properties that were intrinsic to the fluid itself, they were instead capturing properties of the hypersurfaces, of the slices, the three-dimensional slices that we choose. So if you want some uh, technical details on this formalism, please do check out uh, these two papers, this one for the short version and this one for the very long version, very detailed version. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the differences between these two. And just before I do, I just want to add a disclaimer, I am by no means an expert in um, either of these formalisms. I just want to kind of uh, brush over my understanding of the difference between the two. But please do talk a little bit more to to Pierre, who is here at the moment uh, at coffee or lunch or something, if you're interested in more details, or read the papers down here. So this, the original formalism of Bucher was based on properties that were intrinsic to the fluid, and it was developed in the co-moving gauge. And so um, as a consequence, some formalisms were built to describe the average properties of the surface in an arbitrary foliation, so one that was not necessarily co-moving with the fluid. And so these formulas, some of these formalisms are built with domains which evolve along the normal to the slices of the hypersurfaces rather than along the four velocity of the fluid. And a consequence of this is that the rest mass within the domain is not conserved. In addition, some of the average dynamics and the back reaction term in the terms in these uh, formalisms involve things like the extrinsic curvature. So these are things that are a property of the spatial slices themselves. And therefore, um, these kind of quantities depend on things like the normal vector and even worse, derivatives of the normal vector, which can be quite large. And so this can introduce a strong dependence on the spatial foliation. And this is really not what we're looking for in a realistic cosmological model. We want something that is independent of the, um, something like the arbitrary foliation. So the difference in this new formalism is that the averaging domain, one of the differences is that the domain itself is co-moving with the fluid, so it's transported along the four velocity flow rather than along the normal congruence um, of the slices. And, and the variables that we're averaging themselves are rescaled to represent um, intrinsic pro properties of the fluid itself rather than properties of the coordinates. And so this is just a first step towards a fully fluid intrinsic description 
So if we um, foliation independent description, and the way this is done is just by avoiding excessive foliation dependence by using things like the extrinsic curvature. So I'm going to refer to these two different formalisms as um, so this new one is being intrinsic because we're looking at properties that are intrinsic to the fluid. And I'm going to refer to the, uh, the formalisms in arbitrary foliations as being extrinsic because um, a lot of them look at properties that are uh, extrinsic to the fluid. So the main difference between this co-moving and non-co-moving frame is encapsulated by the Lorentz factor, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. But in, uh, in this case, we can really think of the peculiar velocity of the fluid V as the tilt between these two frames. So between the observer frame and with the normal N and the core velocity of the fluid. And so this is really used to cast the variables we're looking at into properties that are intrinsic to the fluid. So basically skipping over many steps, and I said, please do check out the papers for more details, but we basically end up with an equation that looks pretty much the same as the original Bukert formalism, except we'll notice that our scalar variables have these tildes on top. And all this means is that they're scaled relative to the original vari um, variables using the Lorentz factor and the lapse function alpha as well. So just in normal cosmology, what we can do is we can define an effective Hubble parameter H, which is the um, A dot over A. So this reduces to the FLRW H in the correct limits. And then we can go ahead and define cosmological parameters as we normally do. And what these do is they tell us the fractional of the energy density of the universe that is made up of matter, curvature, dark energy, and back reaction. But as Daniel said, in our simulations, we don't have any dark energy. Um, it's just not in our part of the code. So all we're looking at is the contributions from matter, curvature, and back reaction. So the way we calculate these things is we take our simulation and we randomly place uh, some number of spheres with a given radius within that domain. And we calculate our uh, scalars like the expansion rate, the shear, the uh, scalar curvature, etc. And we average, take averages over each of our spherical domains and therefore calculate the cosmological parameters. And what that means is that we can not only study uh, how these cosmological parameters change as a function of scale, so when we change the averaging radius r, but we can also see how they vary as a function of position within the box, so depending on where our observer is. So what I'm going to show you now is a direct comparison between the extrinsic formalism, so the results of our paper in 2019, and this new intrinsic formalism using um, the new Bukert and others results, the, the new formalism. So here, what we have is, uh, before I start saying anything, I'm just going to point to this giant green banner in the top left-hand corner. So these results are extremely preliminary, and uh, Pierre and I are still in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the process of testing this and making sure that all of these results are okay. But I think we're in a position to give at least an idea of the results that we have. So all we're looking at here is a histogram of 500 spheres within our simulation of a one gigaparsec volume. Each of these spheres has a radius of 250 megaparsec, um, and um, this is all at a redshift of uh, effective redshift of zero. And what we're measuring here is we're looking at um, the mean omega matter. So the sorry, the solid histogram is the new intrinsic formalism, and the empty uh, line histogram is the the extrinsic formalism from our previous results. So basically, the point of this plot is that they're exactly the same, and that that's kind of expected because there's not too much difference in terms of the definition of omega m. So what we find here, uh, the mean overall of these spheres is that the, our universe is 98.5% matter, which is pretty close to the 100% that we would expect if we did match the, the FLRW solution. So moving on from this one, some results where we do get something that's a little bit different. Now we're looking at omega r, so the amount of curvature in the universe. Same setup, same spheres in the same snapshot. And what we see here is that we do have a bit of a change from the extrinsic formalism, so the empty histogram, to the intrinsic formalism, which is the filled one here. So our mean has been bumped up a little bit. So the new um, mean value over these spheres is 1.5% curvature, which is something that could be quite significant. And this is not too surprising that we get a difference between these two uh, calculations because we are actually calculating different things. So in the extrinsic formalism, what we're looking at is actually the three Ricci scalar of the hypersurfaces themselves. So this is just the average curvature over our arbitrary foliation. Whereas in the new intrinsic formalism, what we're looking at is something called the fluid intrinsic three curvature. So this is something that is built from the four dimensional Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar and some other things as well. And it's meant to mimic the, the intrinsic curvature in the co-moving slice 
but viewed from the non-co-moving slice, I believe. Sorry if that's horribly wrong. Um, so this is interesting. We get a little bit more curvature in this intrinsic formalism rather than the extrinsic one, but it's really not all that different. So if we do want to um, look at something that is really different, we can look at the, at the calculation of the back reaction parameter. So we'll, we'll notice here that we do have quite a drastic difference between the two. So I'm just going to talk about this for a little bit. Again, not hugely surprising because we are looking at different things. So if you want to look at what the actual back reaction contribution here is the, in the extrinsic formalism, I do point you to my, um, our paper from 2019 and the references for the um, formalism itself on what these definitions are. Um, but basically we get something that's really, really different. And this is something that we are currently thinking about why, why we're getting such a, such a difference, but we do have an idea. So just to point out what the difference is, is the mean in the new formalism um, is about 10 to the minus 3 percent. So, so it's about 10 to the minus 5, and this is down from about 0.8 percent average over these spheres in the, in the extrinsic formalism. So the reason that we think this might be is due to vorticity. So again, this is something that is in progress, and these are some speculations that Pierre and I have been talking about, so do take with a grain of salt. But essentially, as I said before, the extrinsic formalism um, measures properties of the slices them, of the slices themselves rather than the fluid. And therefore, the vector field which describes these slices, or the normal vector, is irrotational by definition. And so what this means is that the vorticity does not explicitly enter the back reaction equations um, themselves. However, the vorticity, of course, still does affect the dynamics of the fluid if it's present which it is present in our simulations, um, and I can talk more about this if someone would like to know, but basically we have a small amount of vorticity in our initial conditions due to our assumption of linearity of the perturbations. However, in the intrinsic formalism, the back reaction variables instead measure properties of the fluid rather than the slices, and this means that the, the vector field describing this fluid is not necessarily irritational, and therefore we do have an explicit definition of the vorticity in the back reaction equations themselves. So we did a little test of this by kind of forcing the vorticity in the back reaction equations in the, sorry, in the intrinsic formalism to be zero. And what we found was that these two things basically are very, very similar. So it seems like it's the addition of vorticity in these back reaction equations that is bringing it back, um, is, is changing the back reaction so drastically. But again, this is something that we're investigating at the moment. And so please do just look out for um, a paper to come at some point in the future for a, a more detailed explanation on this. So this is just a summary of what we find um, on, on these small sub, on these scales of 250 megaparsec, our curvature is a bit larger, our matter is about the same, and um, the back reaction is much, much smaller. Now just, I'm just about to finish, but just to quickly say about something about the whole box average. So while, rather than looking at subdomains within the simulation, if we instead consider an average over the whole box, including the periodic boundaries, then we can make a comparison between the two formalisms as well. Basically, the matter content is about the same. Um, the curvature is quite a drastic difference. And again, I think this is related to, um, to the, the difference in definitions of the curvature. I can see things are going on in the chat. I hope no one's telling me to shut up because uh, I don't want to open it because of this, the stream is currently on my, um, on my screen. Someone just unmute and tell me to shut up if I'm going too far over. But so, so the curvature is much, much larger in this new formalism rather yeah, than... You're a bit out of time, so if you can wrap up soon, that yeah. would be good. No worries, that's all good. But basically, uh, this is something that we're currently investigating um, in terms of why this new back reaction formalism vanishes over the whole box, which is something that uh, Pierre himself said he didn't really expect. And we see a big difference considering an average over the whole box, including the boundaries, or considering a subdomain within the completely contained within the box, but on a, a similar scale to, to the whole box average. What we see, the difference between averaging, for example, over this sphere and in the whole box is about four orders of magnitude. So there's clearly something sneaky going on here that we're currently investigating. So our inkling is that the back reaction over the whole box shouldn't really be this small, and we're trying to come up with an explanation for this at the moment. So sorry for rushing through this last bit here, but I think I'll just leave my conclusions up. Um, um, up for the moment because I've already said it all, but that's fine. So let me just right. stop this. Sorry, I need to stop sharing my screen so that I can um, change the stream back to the Zoom call. Okay. Sorry. <laughs>
Okay, so you, you stopped the, the live stream again? Is that what you did already? Uh... Okay, so we're back and we're live again. So welcome back. And now in this last talk of the session, we have Jim Mertens, a recent prof at uh, St. Louis. So congrats on that and take it away whenever you are ready. Yeah, uh, thanks Haley. Um, yeah, so I'll be uh, focusing on the words in the title here, I guess. Um, so I'll be focusing on and and body implementation within numerical relativity and how we've done this within Cosmograph in particular. Um, so this is work with uh, Chi, who I'm gonna give you know, the last few minutes of this talk to so we can discuss uh, uh, additional applications and some of the work he's been doing. Um, this is also you know, in collaboration with a new grad student, Matt Carney, uh, as well as professors, Glenn Starkman and Tom Goodwin. Um, we all come from some assortment of uh, institutions listed down here. Um, but I am currently at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. So you might wonder, uh, where is St. Louis? Um, so if you, you know, post pandemic happen to be in the US touring, uh, please do come visit. We'd be you know, happy to have, uh, happy to have you here. Um, so we're not, you know, not too far from, from Chicago and other places, but uh, a little bit in the middle of nowhere. So maybe we're going from the East Coast to the West Coast. Feel free to stop here, please do. Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, fortunately, I think I can get away with this because we had a couple of good uh, introduction and sort of motivational talks earlier. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about uh, you know, cosmological motivation for this at all. I'm just going to dive right into it and it'll be a little more uh, technical as a result. Hopefully that's okay. Um, but so, so in general, the problem we're going to be interested in here is looking at the evolution of a, a collisionless matter in OGR. Um, so looking at uh, some phase space distribution, which in principle, uh, we, you know, we, it could interact. There could be sources for this uh, phase space distribution, but um, I'm going to be ignoring those. And, you know, those are important if, for example, you're modeling a, a neutron star or something. Um, but in cosmology, if we're just interested in modeling a collision of stark matter, and we don't worry about that. So the equation we're going to try and solve is this one right here, which is the Einstein loss of equation. Um, so we have some uh, phase space distribution uh, given by this variable f. Um, and this just says that uh, this phase space density is going to be uh, conserved along uh, GT6, basically. Sorry, so I can take this distribution of it along GT6 and it'll remain concerned. And so, as we've heard uh, earlier today, the metric evolution itself, you know, this is a, a fairly well known and solved problem. This has been the work of numerical relativity over the past number of decades. Um, but, the, you know, looking at the metric in conjunction with, especially a collisionless phase space distribution, is, uh, I, I think, a path less, you know, a bit less well trodden. Um, okay, so, how do we? Um, you know, how, how can we get a handle on this distribution or, you know, uh, solving these equations? Um, so method number one, we've heard about some today already. Um, and this is just noticing that our, um, our Einstein glass of equations here, our base phase distribution equations are identical to that of a pressureless fluid, as long as I don't have any velocity dispersion. So that's a perfectly called distribution. Um, and also as long as there are no stream crossings. Um, so the second model, this is just a, a perfect fluid with zero pressure. Um, techniques for you know, solving, looking at fluids uh, date back at least to the 1960s uh, from what I found, and there are different um, numerical schemes for um, um, evolving of a fluid. And in cosmology in particular, there are uh, at least a few works dating back at least to the 90s that I know of where people have looked at um, um, fluids in a cosmological context. Uh, and in general, these were, um, you know, given there were simulations that had some sort of symmetry restrictions, that sort of thing. 
And then more recently, um, groups such as uh, my own Eloisa's and Haley's have uh, uh, generalized this to pool three plus one settings with uh, uh, many fewer symmetries. Um, so, so fluid distributions are, are uh, fluid solutions are great in particular uh, for dark matter because you know, they don't require things like interpolation. Um, you don't have to worry about things like stream processing, although you do, but um, you don't really have to worry about stream crossings. Um, and the evolution tends to be quite stable and extremely accurate. And quick. Um, but we would, at some level, like to model uh, either you know, some velocity dispersion or uh, base phase behavior here. Uh, so in the past, people have also looked at directly discretizing all of phase space. So in general, this is like some crazy six dimensional problem where you track F in a six dimensional grid. Um, so there's some work on this back in the 90s. Uh, again, because it's a crazy six dimensional space, you assume some symmetries. Um, but this has also been looked at in, uh, for example, in Newtonian context. Um, and so this is again, you know, this is much more difficult because now we're looking, you know, we're solving a, a six dimensional instead of three dimensional problem. So numerically this becomes uh, much more difficult to get a handle on. Um, and I also run it into uh, issues like um, when I evolve my phase space distribution from one time to another time, um, grid points in my phase space might not directly map to grid points on the next time step. And so I have to worry about interpolation errors. And then this full six dimensional space, those interpolation, you know, interpolation is more difficult. And so I have to, uh, those errors can compound uh, pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> and so there are other uh, difficulties associated with this, which if you're interested in um, Burton and Shapiro's book, uh, I discusses this a little bit. Uh, okay, so method, method number three here. <clears throat> um, so instead of considering <clears throat> a grid in phase space, uh, we can instead uh, divide our base space distribution into um, discrete particles or tracers, if you like. And so this is just the standard n-body picture of things. Um, so we're just uh, sampling our base space distribution, if you like. Uh, and these n-body and full GR methods uh, do date back to the um, you know, mid-1980s, early 90s. And these were, again, um, implementations that relied on certain assumptions of symmetry. Um, but later on in uh, you know, late 90s, 2000, and more recently in like 2016, there have been full 3 plus 1 implementations. So all of this pretty much focused on uh, collapse of collisionless distributions to black holes. Uh, but we've also had a, a few applications now um, to myself, at least, um, David Davier, yeah, uh, looking at this in our cosmological context. Um, so the, the main issues you run into here, especially in a full GR setting, are issues related to sampling noise. Um, and so I've, you know, I've divided my phase space distribution into some number of tracers. And I need to come up with some scheme for depositing the mass of my particles onto a grid. Um, <clears throat> and so when I do this, you know, usually I, at some level, I would like to smooth the mass distribution. So I reproduce the principle smooth phase space distribution. Um, so this turns out to be, you have to be a little bit careful when you do this. Um, so in particular, one thing to note is that when I take this you know, smoothing scale um, uh, to zero, and as I take my number of particles to infinity, these two limits don't always commute. And so in full GR, um, in particular, I refer you to black hole lattice literature, so you can check that out for, um, um, basically the limit where I've taken the radius to zero before I've taken the number density to infinity. Uh, but in the, in the case of a collisionless space based distribution, really we want to take the limit where the number goes to infinity before the radius goes to zero. Um, so we just have to be a little careful there. All right, so within Cosmograph, um, in cosmology, we're going to be interested in cold distributions. And so this means a zero temperature or a thin phase space sheet. Um, so like a three-dimensional surface embedded in my six-dimensional space. Um, and so what I can do is assign this uh, three-dimensional sheet its own coordinates. And then I can track uh, 
uh, the position and velocity fields uh, as a function of my coordinate system on this sheet. And so this gives me a way to solve for my phase space distribution actually on a grid. And so there's still some difficulty going from uh, this distribution and projecting this to a density field. Um, but in essence, what I can do is uh, in interpolate, if you like, additional tracers of mass, because now I have the, the whole field and not just some sampling of it. And so this, was, this wasn't my idea. This was an idea by Tom Abel, Olivia Hahn, and others. Uh, they started thinking about this at least back in 2011, I guess. Um, and so hopefully, you know, hopefully the resolution of this is coming through the video call. You can see there are sort of you know, numerical artifacts in the case where I haven't resolved my phase space very well. And then over here, you see it's you know, quite a smooth, clean distribution. Um, and so this idea even plays well with AMR. Like I can adaptively refine my position and velocity fields uh, on my phase space. Um, and so this turns out to be uh, essentially useful for beating down the noise that comes as a result of having an embody system. Okay, so, so we've implemented this within Cosmograph. Um, we have, you know, of course, the usual um, numerical, numerical relativity tools, this BSSM scheme, also I constraint damping. Um, if you like, you can um, not just integrate geodesics of massive particles, but massless particles. So you can ray trace through the space time. Uh, you can also, if you like, run the simulation backwards. And this turns out to be fine to do uh, as long as you haven't you know, your base phase distributions have unfolded too many times and become too chaotic. And in that case, you start losing precision pretty rapidly. Um, but if you're not in this regime, you can just run things backward fine. Um, and then you can retrace dynamically through the space time as it evolves backwards. And we've also built in some functionality for comparing to uh, linear theory directly. So either um, there's this trick you can do just, if I want the linear limit, I just scale my amplitudes down to a small number and my perturbation amplitudes. I can evolve my space time and then scale back up. Um, and that, that turns out being the, the linear result. And I can do this in different sectors. So uh, the matter sector by itself, the metric sector by itself, the ray tracing by itself, if you like. Um, and then you can also look at uh, a perform of SVT, scalar vector tensor decomposition, um, whatever gauge you're working in. And you can, for example, see how well this satisfies the linearized constraint equations in GR. Uh, and then I'll let you talk in a bit, but let me just show a couple of results. Um, so the, one of the interesting things I want to advertise is, um, you know, again, this is using a BSSN code, which works in any gauge, so we can look at uh, properties of our space time in any gauge you like. And so we can look at gauges that are close to Newtonian. Uh, we can use this harmonic slicing, which is commonly used in black hole simulations. This is, uh, can be thought of as a driver condition for a constant curvature slicing. And so this is also a, a useful gauge to work in. And then we can also move in, uh, or work in co-moving synchronous gauge, uh, where our coordinates are drifting along with the matter. And then in these different um, gauges, we can ask, well, how well is perturbation theory describing uh, my metric, my matter, and my ray tracing? Uh, and so one of the possibly interesting things we have found is that uh, in synchronous gauge perturbation theory it doesn't seem to work very well. And so in particular, we'd see that the Freeman equations don't seem to be obeyed that precisely. Um, so this is an interesting statement because we can tie our observers to a particular gauge choice if we want. Um, so when we ask about averages, uh, Typically, we're asking about averages according to some particular set of observers. And we actually have the freedom to choose who those observers are. Um, and so if we ask about the set of observers coming in with our fluid at some fixed proper time, uh, it's, it's, not necessary, it's not obvious that um, the average properties of those observers will look like an FRW space time, whereas in harmonic or Newton slicings, um, perhaps uh, they do. And so things look. Um, you just have to be very clear what you mean by uh, when you say a background or an average quantity. Because these things don't always agree. Okay, so let me stop there and let G talk for a little bit. Uh, G, are you here? Yeah, thanks, G.
Okay, so I guess um, I'll use the rest of 10 minutes to introduce um, briefly on AMR and other features in Cosmograph. Uh, by the way, I'm Chi Tian. I'm uh, joining WashU as a postdoc. So, so first question, uh, why, what is adaptive mesh refinement or AMR and why do we need it? So the uh, adaptive mesh refinement is a numerical technique that uh, you can use uh, that allows you to adjust your resolution dynamically during your <clears throat> time evolution during your simulation. This can be very useful because, um, for example, in your <clears throat> uh, uh, cosmological simulation, like your simulation large scale structure, you naturally have over densed region and under densed region, and uh, naturally you want your um, your simulation to have a higher resolution at dense dense region and lower resolution on the old uh, on the under dense region because you don't need that resolution to resolve the dynamics. So for the astrophysical uh, simulation, things are similar. For example, when you are simulating binary black holes and when you are, you will need extremely high resolution in order to resolve the dynamics of the binary black hole. However, for the region far away from black hole, you don't need that high resolution because you don't need enough grid, you don't need that much grid to resolve the ripple of gravitational waves. So, this uh, so uh, the MR technique is designed to solve those uh, difficulties in your simulation to resolve the resolution problem and uh, basically increase your resolution when, whenever and wh wherever you need it. So a very classic design for a very classic implementation of MR is to build a uh, grid hierarchy like this. And you can see that uh, the only uh, courses level will cover the bottom level, level zero, and it will cover the whole computational domain and all the higher um, higher levels will have higher and higher resolution, but they only cover uh, part of this uh, computational domain. So uh, in order to implement this desire, you ha design, you have to, um, uh, you have to uh, uh, resolve those difficulties like uh, when and where to change resolution. That's the first thing you have to determine. And you also have to deal with your parallelization and synchronization uh, in order to synchronize the data on, on those edges. You can see that edges are covered the computation. So a very critical point is your uh, partitioning and clustering scheme. Uh, they are referring to the operations you're going to do with those boxes. So we're going to determine how to partition and uh, how to cluster those boxes. And they have direct connection to your load balancing because you will throw those, distribute those boxes, partition those boxes and uh, distribute those boxes into different uh, computational, lo uh, computational nodes. And uh, the better your load balancing, the, the higher efficiency you can achieve. So this is very important uh, point and uh, your time integration scheme you chose is also very important. So our solution with Cosmograph is to uh, use a uh, open source infra MR infrastructure called Samurai. And uh, so next question is why do we choose it? Uh, so we chose Samurai because Samurai claims that they have they employ special uh, tile um, clustering algorithm and special partitioning algorithm. They call it uh, tile clustering and uh, cascading partitioning algorithm. And um, uh, equipped by those special algorithms, they can scale well to the millions of course. So this is very. Uh, I think this is amazing feature. This opens the gate to the petascale uh, computing in the future. So from the weak scaling uh, plots, you can see that uh, the weak, the, the, the basically uh, weak scales are up to a million, millions of course. This is amazing considering they are involving multiple levels and they are adjusting uh, by pro to producing this, produce these plots, they are adjusting uh, their, uh, their resolution dynamically. So uh, other features in Cosmograph, which is compatible to the MR and uh, includes um, uh, 
uh, vacuum uh, includes mass uh, support to, to different matter fields, uh, including uh, vacuum, dust, fluid, scatter field, uh, and bodies still under construction, and uh, you can only involve it on with uniform grids. So, and it also has a multi-grid solver. You can use it to solve the initial condition, uh, initial constraint equation of Einstein equation. So, thanks to the pattern find the final direct, which is another code, um, it helps it helps us to solve to to identify the, the location of a pattern horizon. And uh, it also includes a module calculates the spin of black hole, and uh, it also includes a uh, general relativistic ray tracing uh, component. So uh, briefly introduce some applications we have applied to the early universe to simulate the, the Ocelon preheating, which is supposed to happen at the very early universe immediately after inflation. And uh, it turns out involving uh, the full GR simulation tends to condensate more Ocelons and the MR feature allow us to zoom in to see whether the, um, the Ocelon will collapse into a black hole. And it turns out it only happens in a very rare uh, parameter space. And we also use it, we also use it to uh, build a homogeneous cosmological model, such as the black hole lattice model. So we're trying to build a lattice model, uh, which has a Hubble-like expansion uh, driven only by the, the black hole. And uh, the black hole can be spinning and non-spinning. And uh, uh, so it, it just uh, implies us um, if you can get, whether you can get a Hubble-like expansion for such uh, inhomogeneous universe. So more interesting things are going on. And uh, thanks for everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, do we have any questions for Jim and Chi? Just unmute yourself and go for it if you like, or put your hand up. I will, I, I will uh, enter live stream maybe instead. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> good one. Yeah, yeah I'll, well, I'll do it. I'll do it. I know we won't be back. Bye. <laughs>